Four Pillar Sports, a podcast for sports fans, made by sports fans. Join Chris and Randy every week as they dive deep into football, basketball, baseball, and professional wrestling. Catch for Pillar Sports on all major platforms. And remember, keep on talking sports. This is your girl, Yannick Taylor, a.k.a. Priestess, hostess of Conversations with the Priestess. Here's a preview of what you may hear on Conversations with the Priestess. We weren't meant for monogamy, let's be honest. Like, we have needs, let's be real. And communicating that, what you want, what you don't want, what sets up... Now, this drink is brown, because I learned something. Since I'm older, I can't do brown liquor anymore. Also, I noticed since I started on hormone replacement there at HRT in 2015, me and certain liquors don't match, don't match well. I don't know whether... And I recognize that a lot of men love to be dominated by women. And that's because men are seen as these leaders, as this big alpha male dominant thing, dominant being. And because they're put on this pedestal of being leaders, sometimes they want to be submissive. Back when I cosplayed a butch queen in South Carolina around 2011, I was on Craigslist. This is when Craigslist was bumping and before they had gotten rid of the personal section. I hope you enjoyed that preview. Join me on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. for Priestess After Dark. Full video versions of the podcast can be found on patreon.com forward slash CWT Priestess. And join me on Fridays at noon for our regular Friday post. Live, love, and be free. Smooches. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, anywhere you download and stream podcasts. When you're a pro, you got to do a little bit of everything. A little. A little. And even a little. And it helps to have something that works as hard as you do. That's why Valspar has a paint for every job, every room, every time. Valspar. You make it happen, we make it possible. Pros, head to Lowe's today and talk to a pro rep about getting up to 10 free gallons of Valspar through our paint trial program. Exclusions apply. See ValsparPro.com for details. Are you tired of endless arguments over what to stream next? It's time to have a real night out again. You've earned it. And if you want to, make it a night out in the city. Indiana residents can save up to 50% off hotel stays. The city of Indianapolis is excited to welcome you back safely. Check out visitindy.com for more details on your favorite museum and attraction reopening plans. I'm Devin. And I'm Steph. And we are the, the Podcast, Podcast from, from the, the Crypt. Crypt. Join us every Friday as we discuss accounts of murder, mayhem, paranormal, and all things spooky. Plus a dash of comedy to help soothe your soul during these chilling tales. You can find us anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, etc. Also, you can find us at thepodcastfromthecrypt.buzzsprout.com and you can choose from there how you'd like to listen. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook, both at The Podcast from the Crypt. Be sure to tune in and listen to us discuss what nightmares are made of. Let's get weird. And as always, hail Satan. And we'll see you in hell. (laughs) This podcast contains adult content. Some of the themes or topics may include information on murder, kidnapping, Torture, dismemberment, maybe some demonic content with information on positions and paranormal activity. This podcast will also include explicit, horrible and foul, socially unacceptable, totally uninhibited, adult themes language. So if you're easily offended, if you're easily triggered, then I highly suggest you turn this off now and if not just keep in mind parental discretion is advised hi 
All right, everybody. I know it's been a minute, and I appreciate everybody bearing with me. I have been in the middle of switching networks, which is why you need to listen to what I'm about to say. If you subscribe on Spotify, on Podcast Addict, pretty sure all of the other platforms, including iTunes, have already been taken care of. What I need you guys to do in the next week, okay, because since my network would not give me a 301 redirect, which I know you guys don't know what that is, I have to literally delete my old feed in order for my new one to kick in. I've already transferred it to iTunes and Spotify and all that stuff, but what I need you to do in the next week after September 1st, I need you to unsubscribe. And I need you to do a fresh search for this podcast and then resubscribe. Okay, that's there's only a couple platforms you have to do that on. And I apologize. I tried to make this as seamless as possible. But people like making shit aggravating sometimes. Really frustrating. But anyway, so I apologize about the delay in episodes. Thank you for being patient. I know my listeners are super cool about that shit. Now, I'm not going to read reviews at the end of this episode. I'm going to do it on the next one. And I know I have a lot of reviews to read, so that'll probably be an extra long episode. And next month, September, you guys are going to love it. I did get a request for Al Capone in one of my uh, reviews. So, in the month of September, you are going to get Bruce Lee and you're going to get Al Capone. Other than that, I do have some new Patreon subscribers to thank. Jen Casto. Maureen Fleming, Emma, Joseph H., and Randy Norton. I am pretty sure those were the only new ones I could be wrong. I'm pretty sure I don't delete any of that stuff in my email, so thank you very much. I hope you're enjoying the Bennington Triangle series on um, Patreon right now. Five episodes, five disappearances, at the end of which very last day of this month, you're going to get an interview from a podcaster friend of mine who is from that area. So, should be pretty fun. But anyway, like I said, I appreciate everybody hanging out, being patient with me. You know, it's been a pain in the ass. Very, very frustrating. So, thank you all very much. And I really hope that you enjoy this show. All right, this is an episode I've been wanting to do for a long time. I read about it about six months ago, and I got to give credit where it's due. There is a Wired.com article written by Brendan Kerner. He accumulated all the information from other local articles and put it all into one. He did a great job on it, and that is where I am pulling a lot of my source information from. Hats off to Brendan Kerner for doing a kick-ass job on this article, but... This episode is about a guy named Gerald Haas, and Gerald Haas honestly is probably one of the most fascinating people I have had to research, and not because he's a criminal or an outlaw or a historical person, but because he is a computer genius who lives off the grid at certain points in his life, and you guys are going to learn a little bit about his early life here in a second, but it is super interesting. But I do have to tell you right now, you are going to have to pay close attention because there is a lot of information in this episode. So Gerald was the son of a firefighter, and his mother was an insurance agent, and they divorced when he was young. And he was one of those kids from the 80s, right? He found his love of programming back in Christmas when he was a kid when he got a Commodore 64. So as a preteen, he would pretty much just dive into gaming. He was in his room for hours. He was always screwing around with a a computer. He was writing really simple software on analog cassettes and uh he was starting to get online with a uh, 300 baud modem and by the way there's a lot of computer talk in here that i particularly don't understand so just so you know that okay so haas was a very very smart kid and he pretty much skated through school. He was from uh, Springboro, which is in Ohio. It was a very well-to-do suburb of Dayton. 
He could ace any test, okay? He would be staying up all night playing Super Mario Brothers, you know, the night before, and he would just go into school and just ace tests. The dude didn't have to try. He graduates high school, and he goes to Ohio University, and he was studying computer science there. And after his sophomore year, he just kind of, it says that he just washed out. So he decides to float around a little bit. And he travels to Florida with $200 in his pocket and lived on the streets for months as a homeless person. And he actually loved the chance to observe society from an outcast's point of view. When he was living as a homeless person in Florida, he never spent one single penny of that $200 he had. Instead, he saved it for a bus fare home to Ohio At the end of the day, he didn't even use it for bus fare. He kept the money and he ended up hitchhiking home. Like I said, he's definitely a fascinating guy, okay? Later on, he would say that he credited his dabbles in homelessness with shaping some of his core values. And he was quoted as saying, Given my prior past, my idea of living maximally is likely closer to the average Joe's minimalism. And he wrote that online to friends, and he continued to say, I don't like money or much of what it represents in modern society. And it's like, okay, man. And as you're going to find out, this dude is very, very intelligent. So after he gets back to Ohio... Gerald Haas goes to Hawking College, and it's a two-year technical school in Nelsonville, Ohio, where he trained to become a broadcast engineer. You know, he was working at the campus TV station, screwing around with, you know, all that equipment, but his main hobby and preoccupation outside of that was he did psychedelic audiovisual shows as part of a performance art group. And they called themselves the 555 Timers. And they named themselves after an integrated circuit used in gaming joysticks. So, while he's at Hawking, his nickname was Derry. Okay, and he was on the rave scene very, very hard. And he was also consuming a lot of drugs. And one of his buddies said... Derry would find something to put up his nose, and regardless of what it was, he'd get involved. And that was one of his buddies that he was in that uh, audio group with. So in 1998, after he got his associate's degree, he goes and he settles in a town of Athens. And he had a full-time job as an ISP technician. He had some freelance computer coding gigs as well. And in the late 90s and early 2000s, there were a lot of very skilled programmers. So anyone proficient with a Lightwave 3D or Macro Media Director, they could easily make six figures. But Haas had a tendency to botch every good opportunity that he was given. No matter how straightforward an assignment was, he would take the most convoluted approach possible and he did it just to prove how how smart he was and how much smarter than other people he was with computers. So if a client asked him for a project to be coded in a really simple language like Lingo, he'd do it in C++ instead, and he would miss his deadline. And one of his buddies said, You ask him to walk a straight line, he'd find a way to insert algebra into it. So... Haas's productivity was also like kind of kicked really hard because of his escalating drug use. And he was taking all kinds of opiates. He was taking oxymorphone, hydrocodone, fentanyl, dilaudid. And he had suffered by this point in time in the early 2000s multiple overdoses. And his friends come to him and they're like, listen, man, you need to slow down on the on the drugs. He would just say, listen, I got an attention to detail. You know, I'm, I'm going to be fine. And he actually said in an online chat once, I do that dumb thing where I actually research the drugs I use. I know how silly of me. 
Okay, so there are occasions, though, where Haas would temporarily go sober and clean. And when he did that, this dude was absolutely brilliant. Okay, and one of his buddies recalls, Haas figured out how to dramatically improve an open source video encoder so that it could crunch multi-megabyte files in a matter of minutes rather than hours. So his buddy is like, dude, you need to, you need to make money off of this. Like, this is amazing. Haas is like, well, I don't know. You know, I really don't want to do it. And then he just decided to scrap the project. He's like, nah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and it's just like, like I said, this same buddy was, said he was like Cypher from the Matrix. You know, you see code, but I see brunettes and redheads. But when he reached that genius moment, when he was on the cusp of some big idea that could maybe change the world, he would get nervous. So, going back to Haas's drug habits, he had a fondness for hallucinogens. And he was really, really into DMT. And this was known as the quote-unquote businessman's trip. Because it only lasts a few minutes, but it distorts time to where the person using it feels like they are super high for hours and hours. And Haas sometimes liked to get really messed up on this shit. And when he did this shit, he would go to this huge rave in a three-piece suit wearing a gas mask. And he would just be hanging out, just basically doing it for reaction because he was super fucked up on this stuff and he's just like i just want to do it just to do it in 2006 Haas's childhood friend by the name of Jarek kocher contacted him about a job and kocher headed up a web development firm outside of dayton ohio and he hired Haas to work as a uh, full stack developer and Haas didn't even really have to go to work. He did the job remotely from Athens for like four years. Until one day, Kocher drove over to his house from Dayton just to check on him, see how he was doing. And I shit you not, when he gets there, he finds out that Haas is living with his girlfriend and her father in a house that had literally been hit by a damn tornado. There was this huge hole in the roof. The floors were all buried beneath like mounds and mounds of newspapers, like old cereal boxes and plates of like rotten food. And it just smelled god awful. And Haas seemed oblivious to it. He just didn't even pay attention because his attention was devoted to chatting with people online. And Haas, you know, would be online talking to people and he would say one of the things was like maslow didn't know about the internet when he created his hierarchy of needs i could be wrong but i think it's just below food you know so he had this alias named tone hog and he's just online just like for countless hours and he moderated a cyberpunk web forum and he would just talk about, like, his pet topics, which were libertarian politics, social anxiety, high-fat diets, and bondage, all right? So, I mean, can't hate a guy for that, you know? So, Kocher is actually worried about Haas's well-being. He's like, dude, you cannot be living like this. This is not normal. This isn't right. So he convinced Haas to move in with him and his family in the suburbs of Dayton and start working full-time at his company, which was called Edge Webware. So Haas, he left his girlfriend behind in Athens and quit using drugs. He just, he left and he's like, well, I'm just gonna leave, quit using drugs for a while. But when he was in the office, like actually working on site, he was known as the lone weirdo amid Midwestern squares, okay? He was the expert there on things like government surveillance and a new thing called Bitcoin. And this guy named Ron Campbell, who was a president of U Creative, which is a marketing firm that had brought Edge Webware in-house, he said this about Gerald Haas. The way his ego worked, 
He was turned on by the things he knew that you didn't know. He felt like he knew a whole world that you didn't. That you're living in this polished 2.2 children white picket fence world. But he knows a dark world you know nothing of. A humanity you know nothing of. And that was a direct quote from this dude about Gerald Haas. So in 2013, Haas could not sustain that way of life. It was almost like too normal for him. So he moved out of Coacher's home in 2013 and he got back with his girlfriend that was back in Athens and then he just kind of drifted back into his old habits. So he would start showing up for work like hours late and he would be dressed in just like ratty black clothes all the time. He would be falling asleep at his desk. They said his dental hygiene was so poor that several of his teeth just rotted, just rotted out. And one Halloween, he ripped off his shirt and ran around the office with his arms out saying, I'm getting the idea, man. I'm getting the idea. Just random shit like that. He was also known to tell really, really big lies. And at one point, he submitted his notice to Edge Webware, the company he was working for, and he told them that he had saved up $40,000 and was going to move out of country with his girlfriend and her father. And he told them that he needed to do this to escape the U.S. government because the U.S. government was targeting his girlfriend's dad because of his radical politics. So he goes and he puts in his notice and he tells everybody bye on that last Friday. And then the next week he shows back up to work and he's just like, well, all my money got stolen just a few hours before my flight, so I couldn't go anywhere, so I had to come back to work. But the company he worked for was like, Dude, you just come on back. You're welcome back here anytime because he was one of those rare minds that they just wanted really, really bad. And his boss would say this, I can't tell you how many times a client would say, can you program this in X? And I would go to Jerry and say, I can hire a contractor to do this, but do you want to take a crack at it? So Coacher goes on to say, that Gerald would be like, sure. And within 24 hours, he'd know the language well enough to have an intelligent conversation with our client. And within a week, he'd be coding competently in it. And he says, I can't tell you how many times that happened. Which is just another thing, you know, stating how brilliant he was. He's like, that shit does not happen all the time. You don't understand how smart this guy was. So, in November of 2016, Haas ends up cutting ties with Edge Webware because um, Coacher would pick him up and take him to work and stuff like that because Gerald Haas never bothered to get a driver's license and he never drove. So, he goes to pick him up for work one morning and Haas comes out of this rental house, which is just run, run down. And he's trembling and holding a 22 caliber pistol. And he said he'd been up all night because people had been banging on his door threatening to murder him and his girlfriend. So he told Coacher, he's like, listen, just give me a day to recover. I'm going to be fine. And Coacher's like, okay, that's fine, man. Just take a day or two, come back to work. And he just never went back to work. He never showed up to uh, work again. So... That job was like a main source of stability for Gerald Haas. And when he quit working, he kind of went down that drug road again. He His behavior came increasingly erratic, and he started losing a lot, a lot of weight because he just wasn't eating. So by the summer of 2017, his mom, who's named Judith Wallace Huff, uh, she started to become very, very worried about him to the point where she's like, okay, I need to step in and do something. So she convinced him to move and his girlfriend into a, uh, an old camper on her property, which was like 30 acres. And 
while he was on that 30 acres back in this camper, he kicked his opiate addiction cold turkey. All right. And all he had was just like a real shitty internet connection. And that was it. Good for him. You know, he kicked that habit just straight cold turkey and it was hard for him. And everything was going well until autumn of 2017. And the, the camper didn't have heat. So then it was starting to get pretty chilly at night, you know, chilly during the day. And. He said he didn't like it because there was no, not enough light in there. He said it felt like he was in jail. So one night after Thanksgiving, he ran off into the Appalachian forest and went roaming around for days out in the forest. And he was eventually arrested for breaking into an old backwoods church because he was trying to fight off frostbite. And that was literally the only reason he broke in there was to stay warm. And then he was eventually returned into his mother's care. Haas himself would later claim that he'd had a profound spiritual experience while living in this forest. And he said he sensed a phantasmic deer alongside him as he hiked and that the animal taught him, quote unquote, to walk in the world again. So his mom knew that he hated living in this camper, all right, out on this property. So in December, she helped him move to Columbus, Ohio. And this was one of the places, it's like a technology mecca, like there's a lot of technology in Columbus. So she's like, you're probably going to find a lot of work here. This is where I'm going to put you up at. So she rented him a furnished apartment and stocked it full of groceries. But by the time January came around, he left and he had to move into a homeless shelter because he had been evicted. So he was finally sober, okay? And despite like all these circumstances, he was really trying to improve himself still, which is weird to say because he's just kind of all over the place. He would sell loose cigarettes to the other homeless shelter residents, and he would go to the public library to send his resume out to pretty much anywhere that was willing to take it. So in early 2018, his luck does change a little bit for the better, and he meets a woman at a coffee shop who invited him to stay at her apartment, and they start having a little bit of a fling. Well, he ends up meeting a man through her by the name of Charles Ford, and they end up becoming friends, and when his little fling slash relationship kind of went shitty not long after that... Ford invited Haas to stay at his condo. So they ended up becoming even closer friends, and they even traveled together to a uh, nutritional conference in Indianapolis. And that's because Haas was, uh, he was really devoted to herbal supplements uh, that were sold by Life Vantage. And Charles Ford, who was a mechanic but sold nutritional supplements on the side, he was an independent distributor for this uh, Life Vantage herbal supplements shit. So them two kind of got along quite well. All right, so I'm not trying to jump around, but we do have to backtrack a little bit, and we have to introduce two very important figures that are going to come up when it comes to his death. The first one is going to be a guy named Emmanuel Sylvia. In October of 2017, he was a storage engineer for J.P. Morgan Chase in Columbus. And according to Sylvia, at that point in time, he had a, what is known as an office space moment, which for anybody who's seen that movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And he basically had the sudden realization that he's just like, fuck corporate culture. I can't do it anymore. It's just sucking the soul out of me. So he decides to quit his job and start a business, and he wanted to start this business with a purpose to help others. And this is the company that would eventually come to be known as Tesser, T-E-S-S-R. And this company is also a major player in a lot of the theories, okay? So Emmanuel 
Sylvia's basic idea for the startup, okay, was to create a new kind of blockchain, a digital public ledger, which would be spread across a network of trusted computers. He wanted to do a blockchain that could communicate seamlessly and still be secure with all other blockchains regardless of where they came from or who made them or what their coding was or anything like that. So over time, Sylvia is like, okay, I want to revolutionize higher education. In particular, he wanted to simplify basic transactions such as transfer of credits between institutions. Okay, he also wanted to have a system of transparent smart contracts, which is where a company would actually put you through school and buy the courses for you, and they could easily pay and monitor your progress, you know, your grades and stuff like that. And to be honest with you, the company that I work for, they do that. If you work there and you hold a C plus average, they'll pay for your school. They'll pay for your college. They, they're just like, yeah, you know, it's going to make our company better. It's going to make you better. Why the hell not? So, I mean, it's pretty awesome. Not all companies do that though. So Sylvia had like 20 years of IT experience. All right. He was very good with computers, but he did not have the coding skills to create this blockchain that he had envisioned in his mind. So in early 2018, he goes looking for a programmer to be Tesser's lead developer. While he's looking for this, he sets up a meeting with a web developer named Etienne Fieri. He was wanting her to build the Tesser.io website. So Fieri had heard that the startup had an opening for a programmer. So she brought along a friend of a friend who she'd uh, been told was just desperate for work. And his name was Gerald Haas. And how she knew Gerald Haas was through this guy named Charles Ford, who Haas was friends with. And I'm not 100% sure how the hell this Charles Ford dude, being a, I think he's 67 year old mechanic, you know, selling herbal supplements, why he's involved in all this tech shit. But... He's the one who introduced Gerald Haas and Etienne Fieri, who was, uh, she was French. So as soon as Emmanuel Sylvia meets Gerald Haas, they shake hands and Haas flips open his laptop and says, what do you need coded? Sylvia is like trying to throw him a bunch of trick programming shit, you know, just to challenge him after Haas is just like, just doing it without even thinking about it, just going through it, bam, bam, bam. And Sylvia is like, okay, dude, you do you want to join Tesser? Like he asked him to join Tesser right there on the spot. And to Sylvia, he's like, I'm the luckiest freaking guy in the world, you know, that I just found this programmer and this coder. You know, I am lucky. So he made Gerald Haas a co-founder. And Sylvia said... The programming language we use to write smart contracts. Solidity? Gerald picked it up in a day or two. I've been in the industry for 20 some years and met a lot of brilliant people and Gerald was one of the best. He definitely had this extreme talent. So, Sylvia and Haas become co-founders of this Tesser. And they start working in the back of a friend's vape shop you know, after hours, and they're hacking away at this code, and they would crash from exhaustion, and they had two sofas in the back there that they would just sleep on, and Haas focused all of his time on getting this blockchain coded, and he was using this newly made TSRX token for tuition payments. Now, he also helped design cryptocurrency wallets that could be opened only with biometric data rather than passwords. And Tesser called this the BioKey Ring. Like I said, there's a lot of computer talking here I don't understand, okay? So, 
while he's doing all this coding for Tesser, you know, like setting up this blockchain framework, doing all this coding, he was also doing freelance jobs too. And he was doing that so he could make money because he wasn't making money off of Tesser it's because he's waiting for startup pay. So he had very little time to actually relax. But when he did, he would always be hanging out with Fieri. And they started dating a couple days after they both joined Tesser. And after two weeks of them meeting, they moved in together. Like, they were in it to win it, right? So in early May of 2018, Tesser is causing, like, a big stir in the Columbus tech scene. And they had this uh, reputation. And the reason Columbus was so important important with like this blockchain startup is because Ohio was the first state to accept Bitcoin for tax payments. So that meant that Ohio was ahead of the curve when it came to crypto ventures is what they called it. You know, just like anything computer and technology related, they were ahead of the curve. They're like, yeah, let's go. Let's do it. Let's be the first ones. So like they were in the right place at the right time. So all these small investors start pumping money into this uh, startup. So Sylvia and Haas actually have enough money to lease an office at the idea foundry which is a uh it's a place west of downtown columbus after they get settled into this new place they start making rounds at columbus startup week and they were promoting the pre-sale of the tsrx token so for a few weeks these select people who were buying into it were allowed to use this uh ethereum cryptocurrency to purchase tesser tokens for the rough equivalent of 10 cents each so if the tokens price rose when the crowd sale happened that fall pre-sale customers were in line to make a shitload of money and haas actually said this uh in a text message to a potential buyer he said Investors in the tokens get 5,000% or more profits from the move. It's a really weird hack to the whole standard financial system model of investors, stocks, etc. And I'm pretty cuffed about the whole thing. So he's like selling the shit out of it and he knows that it's going to be huge. He's like, this is going to revolutionize how everybody does cryptocurrency with uh you know academics and higher education and shit so in may and june with tesser there's a bunch of people who are just like buying buying and buying all these tsrx tokens all right so sylvia and haas start talking about you know hey if tesser becomes a hit we're going to be multi-millionaires, man. Like, our lives are going to change forever. And the two would joke between themselves about how they have little interest in materialism, and they would joke about how they would just cash out of the company and become wandering Buddhist monks, you know. So you're going to hear a couple different varying stories from people involved when it comes towards the middle and end of this episode, right? Haas was also bragging to friends on the other side of the spectrum that he was looking forward to becoming filthy rich. And Sylvia would later go on to say him and Haas decided to cancel plans to sell tokens to the public and that he and Haas became intent on figuring out how to distribute free tokens instead. So in mid-August... As all these people working for Tesser, they're scrambling to get this uh, educational blockchain out on beta. And Sylvia noticed that Haas was becoming very, uh, what he said, frazzled and depressed. And Haas confided in him and said that he and Fieri were having troubles. And he said, she's expressed wanting to keep me for herself but doesn't want to be kept herself. And he had written that in a text message to Sylvia. And he goes on to say, This imbalance hits my Libra energy to the core. He also says 
that there were people intent on causing him harm, like trying to kill him. And he never said any of their names, and he never gave any reasons as to why these people were supposedly trying to cause him harm, right? In late spring, early summer of 2018, they were trying to raise $30 million from investors. So Haas, he had received 1.5 million tokens as part of his compensation package. And it, he believed that if Tesser panned out, he was going to make a lot of money. So he had been pushing himself to finish this code, you know, because he had to launch the startup platform in the fall. So all of this critical software that he had written was stored on hard drives that he carried around in this backpack. And he never made any copies of his work. Remember that. He did not back up anything. It is very important to know as well that this backpack that he had stayed glued to his shoulder. And I mean, I had read one article where they said when he went to go take a shit in the bathroom, that backpack went with him. He did not leave it anywhere. So this whole Tesser thing to Gerald Haas is like a, um, it's a last chance to get all this money and be respected as a coder and programmer because he had pretty much pissed away most of his youth. So let's talk about the relationship between Fieri and Haas for a minute. Now, like I had mentioned, they were introduced by a mutual friend named Charles Ford. Like I had mentioned, he is a 67-year-old auto mechanic who sold nutritional supplements in his free time. And Ford is actually the person who emailed Haas's resume to Fieri. And that's when she brought him into that Tesser interview. And they bonded over uh, composing music. They were both very into that. Gerald Haas actually still has a lot of stuff on SoundCloud that you can check out. And I did see a YouTube channel if you type in Gerald Haas. Uh, I'm not sure if it's him. I didn't watch it. But uh, it might be. But anyway, they had both also had drug problems. So they kind of bonded over that. Um, you know, he had gotten sober. He had been just addicted to opiates for years and years and he was clean and Fieri herself had a prior back injury and she was hooked on painkillers for a long time so they kind of bonded over that now when they moved in together they were staying at like an extended stay hotel in Columbus there and they were trying to save up for a house and they even opened up a joint bank account together now, according to Fieri, she had previously planned on never marrying anybody until she met Gerald Haas. And she had said in an interview, he struck me hard. I fell into, well, not to be too poetic, but I fell into the position where what I wanted in my secret places was possible in the real places. Which... I mean, it makes sense to me, you know what I mean? Like, what she had always longed for romantically in her in her heart, she realized it was possible she was going to get that in real life. So then we get to August 30th. And this is where Fieri sees Haas for the last time. Fieri later told detectives that she'd last seen her boyfriend on August 30th, shortly before the Tesser board meeting. She said Haas had been coding nonstop for days, and he was popping a lot of legal quote-unquote smart drugs, which is Phenibut, and this is a Soviet-era tranquilizer, which is supposed to enhance concentration, but you should also know one of the side effects of this is really bad anxiety. She says that he had called her to say he was suffering from acute anxiety, and Fieri suggested they grab an early dinner and relax before the meeting, because this was a huge meeting, okay? So the two met at a mall and started to walk to a nearby restaurant. And she says that Haas raced ahead and darted around a street corner, 
when she made that same turn that he did, he was gone. He just disappeared into thin air. She said that she wasn't too concerned at first because he would isolate himself a lot. And when he was felt overwhelmed or something or stressed out, he would just kind of isolate himself away from people. And I mean, it was to the point where he would pace the streets of Columbus at night wearing a baggy black hoodie and he would pull the strings on the hoodie so tight around his head that all you could see were his eyes and he would just walk around the streets at night. So after days passed, all right, and Fieri had not heard from him, she just assumed he had gone to visit his mother, who lived quite a ways away. She lived in Ohio by the West Virginia border. You know, that's a couple hours away. So when Haas's mom emailed her looking for her son in mid-September, two weeks later, that's when Fieri is like, shit, if she's looking for him, then he's not there. That's when she reported him missing to police. So again, on August 30th, this is the last time that Sylvia sees Haas. And he says that his last interaction with Haas, it took place just after the Tesser board meeting, which was held in a, an office park on the night of August 30th. He said that Haas was visibly distraught and that he had confronted Sylvia on one of the sidewalks. Sylvia says that he laid down on the sidewalk right there on the concrete and started moaning that Fieri's group was out to get him. He also said that there was sensitive material on his phone that he really needed to delete and get off of there. And Sylvia, you know, in a later interview, he's like, I never saw him like so out of it like that. The dude was just really really broken down and he said that he actually feared for his safety but he couldn't really say anything because after Gerald Haas told him this shit he just hops up and takes off again just like boom he's gone just takes off so we're still on the same day and now we get to Charles Ford who is the last person to see Gerald Haas alive Ford was invested in Tesser. He didn't have a lot of money in there. He, They said he had a modest amount of money, but he was looking to basically become a blockchain millionaire. When he invested this money, they put Ford's wife, who for some odd reason lives in Florida, they put her on the board of advisors for some reason. I don't really understand that. But, like I had mentioned earlier, Haas had no car, he never had a driver's license, and he calls Ford on the evening of August 30th, and this is when he asks him for a ride to the Tesser board meeting. They went to a rendezvous point, which was a park across from a shopping mall, which is where Fieri last saw him. And Ford says when he pulls up in his car... Haas pops out of the bushes as if he'd been hiding and he gets into the car and he tells Charles Ford that people are attempting to steal his money and that they are willing to OD him to get it. So he takes him to the board meeting, okay? And after Haas confides in Sylvia and has that breakdown on the sidewalk, he goes to Ford's condo he didn't want to go back to his hotel suite that he had with Fieri. So Ford says that he never slept the entire night and instead he was sitting there going away at his laptop, just going, going to work. And one of the emails that he sent that night was addressed to a company he did freelance work for. And it contained a request to mail him paper checks instead of depositing his payments into that joint bank account that he had with Fieri. So the next morning on August 31st, Haas asked Charles Ford to drive him south towards Cincinnati. And he, he didn't give any reason for the trip, and Charles Ford never asked him about it. So they go down I-71 for a little while, and Haas insisted that they switch over to I-75, which, you know, he gave no explanation for why he wanted to switch over. So Ford pulls off at an exit, 
in uh, Clinton County and decided to, uh, you know, put gas in his vehicle at a BP station before they got on to the I-75. So after he fills his car full of gas, Charles Ford says he goes into the gas station's convenience store to buy water and snacks while Gerald Haas stayed outside to smoke a cigarette. Charles Ford later tells the police that the store's credit card system was on the fritz, which made his checkout 30 to 45 minutes long. So when he finally got done checking out and walking out of the gas station, and he had, you know, his candy and snacks, he says that Haas and his backpack were gone. Four Pillar Sports, a podcast for sports fans, made by sports fans. Join Chris and Randy every week as they dive deep into football, basketball, baseball, and professional wrestling. Catch for Pillar Sports on all major platforms. And remember, keep on talking sports. The great visionary leader of India, Mahatma Gandhi, said, It is health that is real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. Listen to the Healthy Grocer radio show on your favorite podcast platform. We know that health is our greatest wealth, and we will be discussing all aspects of natural healing. Explore everything from supplements, superfoods, and healthy lifestyle choices to help conquer stress and boost productivity. Top industry experts and natural health professionals join us for a deep dive into our healing journey. You can find the Healthy Grocer radio show on demand every day wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And remember, health is your greatest wealth. So on November 3rd, okay, we went from August 31st to November 3rd, 2018 in Clarksville, Ohio. Three hunters named Eric Myers, William Myers, and uh, a friend of theirs by the name of Bill O'Brien, who uh, Bill O'Brien was a big Cincinnati logistics guy, and he owns like a whole shitload of land where people would hunt, and they were hunting on this land. And they had shot a deer the previous evening, and they gave up tracking it. They were going to go out and try to track it again in the morning. So, on November 3rd, the three guys are out uh, looking at the edge of uh, of this soybean field. And they were trying to, like I said, track this buck. I don't know if you guys are hunters, but basically if you shoot a buck and you wound it and you don't kill it, you have to track it. Because that wound more than likely is going to eventually kill him. So basically you have to almost follow a blood trail to find to find the deer. Had to do it several times. It happens. You know, but uh, they're going on the edge of this soybean field. And they're really hoping to find this buck because they're following its trail. And Eric looks down and he sees like what looks like a stone, you know, laying on the ground. And he kneels down to look at it. And he realizes that it is a human skull. And it's a jawbone is missing, but its upper teeth are all still up top and, and it said a healthy shade of white. So the three of them leave the forest immediately and call 911. A dozen investigators from Warren County Sheriff's Office, they go out into this forest and shit on ATVs and they search the entire area around the skull. And that's when they spotted a headless skeleton that was uh, slumped against a honeysuckle tree. Its right leg was bent sideways at a 90 degree angle, and its left leg still had some muscles on it. It was straight out. Nearby, they found a rib, a couple arm bones, and uh, coyotes, you know, and fox out there. They had been going to work on this on this corpse after death they found no man-made objects in this area that might indicate any kind of obvious cause of death there was no gun no knife no rope no drug paraphernalia so they start going deeper into the forest and the crime scene unit finds two black sneakers, a dark shirt, and a pair of black pants 
with a vine threaded through the loops. And the clothes, the condition that they were in suggested that, uh, that it had been removed by scavengers, you know, some wild animals out there in the forest. But inside his pants pocket, they, uh, they find a wallet and it's got a big wad of cash that was still in there and a subway rewards card. And they find a rewards cards for a chain of erotic boutiques as well. And they also find his state ID, which was Gerald Christopher Haas. And he was born on September 30th, 1975. So they run the name through an Ohio law enforcement database. And they learned that he had been reported missing seven weeks earlier. They realized that he had lived in Columbus, which was 80 miles away from where this body was found. 80 miles They find out that he had last been seen at a gas station, which was one county over from where the hunters, you know, found the body. And then they find out that he had disappeared with his black backpack that never left his side, that was always on his shoulder. And what he carried in there was known as the tools of his career. Okay, he was a computer programmer. So inside his black backpack, he would carry three smartphones, two Dell laptops, an Amazon tablet, and a shitload of USB sticks and cables. Like I said, he never let this backpack out of his side. The crime scene unit realized that this backpack was never found anywhere in the woods. So the day after they collect all this evidence in the woods, which is near Clarksville, four investigators from the Warren County Sheriff's Office, they go to Columbus, Ohio, which was about two hours away. The first place they go is to the uh, police department, and they spoke to the detective who had taken the and filed the missing persons report for Haas, you know, like seven weeks earlier. The sad fact about this is the Columbus police really didn't put any effort into trying to look for Haas because their point of view was he's an adult, so he's pretty much free to do as he pleases. I have a lot of mixed feelings about that. And to be honest with you, like after a certain amount of time and somebody filing a missing persons report including this dude's girlfriend and his mom, maybe you should go out and fucking look for him a little bit. But anyway, the Warren County investigators, they decide to split up into two pairs, and two of them headed to notify Gerald Haas's mother, who lived, like I said, right by the West Virginia border. And the other two people were Lieutenant Chris Peters and Sergeant Brian Houndshell. And I hope I pronounced that right, Houndshell. They stayed in Columbus to start interviewing Emmanuel Sylvia and, uh, you know, Etienne Fieri and Charles Ford, okay? So they start going around interviewing all these people. One of the first people that Peters and Houndshell tracked down was Emmanuel Sylvia. And he asked them to meet in a Kroger parking lot near his house. He didn't want them coming to his house. And they said that as soon as Sylvia stepped out of his car, he walked up to him and said, did they offer police protection? And he didn't explain why he asked that question, but he starts going off into this story about his partnership with Haas. He starts telling him everything. And one of the investigators had wrote down in the interview, like a summary of the interview, he said uh, that Sylvia does not trust her and does not like her. And said that Sylvia had described her as very rough around the edges and didn't give him a good vibe and that something was off about her. That same day, the detectives meet Etienne Fieri in a steak and shake parking lot. And they made the observation that she looked like she was absolutely shattered. Contrary to what Sylvia had told them, when they met her, she was crying her eyes out. And she was swearing that her and Haas were very much in love and had been inseparable to the very end. 
And the two investigators made that observation. They're like, dude, this is like a woman who is completely shattered finding out this news, you know. When they start talking about Gerald Haas, Fieri actually agrees with Sylvia. And uh, because Sylvia had mentioned that his mood had deteriorated, you know, in that month of August... That's about the only thing they agreed on. And she and she blames Tesser for his like kind of mental downfall and his mood and stuff like that. So according to Fieri, Haas had become disillusioned with the startup. And she said, we just had the feeling they were telling people what they wanted to hear, whatever they wanted to hear, because they were like, hey, let's be millionaires. But Gerald wasn't like that. I'm not like that. I don't know. Maybe we're just hippies at heart. And Fieri actually cut back her involvement in Tesser, uh, when the, uh, when the company started doing like the token pre-sales. That's when Fieri was like, all right, I'm going to step back a little bit. I'm just going to come by the sidelines and chill out for a minute. But Sylvia, he, totally disputes Fieri's claims and said that uh, he was totally committed to using Tesser to provide free education for the betterment of society. And he said that he had no regard for personal enrichment. So they have two totally separate sides of the story that they're trying to get through. All right, the investigators. So then they go to talk to Charles Ford. Ford said he went looking for Haas in the soybean field across from the gas station and then all along the country roads that uh, are off that state route leading to I-75. Then he also says he stopped at a Burger King during his search and bought a double cheeseburger for the clerk at the BP station since he had heard her mention that she was hungry. So let me... (laughs) So while Charles Ford is at this gas station, taking 30 to 45 minutes for this checkout, he hears the gas station attendant mention how hungry she is. So after his friend fucking disappears, he goes out searching for a little bit and then he stops at a Burger King and he's like, I'm going to go buy that, buy that girl at the gas station a double cheeseburger and take it back to her. Honestly, kind of weird, you know? So the detectives are like, okay, there's a few things wrong with Ford's story. And police sec- records show that um, when they were questioning him, they were asking him very direct questions, very to the point questions, one sentence, and then Ford would go off until like a 10 minute, you know, rant and barely answer their questions. So... The detectives really couldn't understand how it could have taken 45 minutes for the BP station to fix a credit card fuck up in their machines. And they didn't understand why Ford hadn't bothered to call Haas's cell phone not even once after he had disappeared. So the investigators are sitting here like, okay, this guy has to know what happened to Gerald Haas. So after the detectives go back to Warren County and they start checking into Charles Ford's story, which is super weird. And the manager of the BP station where Charles Ford had filled his gas tank and bought those snacks, she goes and says that there is no way the credit card system had malfunctioned for 45 minutes. 20 minutes was the absolute maximum downtime. So the cops go and talk to the clerk who Ford said he had bought that double cheeseburger for. And she told the detectives a man had offered to bring her food, but never returned to the store. So a few days later, after the body is found on November 7th, police records show that the investigators did call Haas's mother uh, to see if she knew anything about her son's friend, Charles Ford, because his story is just deteriorating okay she told them she'd spoken to ford in mid-september after haas had been missing for about two weeks 
and that she'd been struck by something he had told her. And she said that Charles Ford told her that Haas would be discovered dead in a field. So that's a little bit weird, right? So the same day the detectives find out that Ford had said that to Gerald Haas's mother, they tell him to come to the headquarters in Warren County. And they grilled him for hours about all the inconsistencies in his statements and the fact that he had never once called Haas's cell phone the day of or even after he had disappeared. And the investigators told Ford that they were certain this was because he knew Haas was already dead. But Ford came back and said that he'd seen Haas remove the batteries from his phone as a way to avoid being tracked by satellites. So there would have been no point in trying to call him. And the thing about it was, is Haas had three cell phones. He used one for voice calls, one for the internet, and one is like a PDA. So the detectives are trying to get like a confession out of Ford. And they are sitting there like, listen man, we'll understand if some accident happened, if he died of a heroin ever overdose, and you just had to kind of dispose of the body, like we'd understand that. I think you're a good person, and I think you ended up in a really bad situation that there was no good answer to. You know, and what another investigator said, you tried to solve the situation the best you could because you're a problem solver. You're an entrepreneur. But Ford just was not even shaken, man. Was not even phased by this shit. He was even told that a cadaver dog had perked up upon coming into contact with his Saturn. So, after a polygraph exam, during which he was flagged for one instance of deception, Ford was allowed to go back to Columbus and the detectives hurried up and got a search warrant for his phone data and a subpoena for his bank records, and the suspected crime that they listed for this was, of course, murder. So the detectives at this point are very confident that Charles Ford more than likely killed Gerald Haas because, you know, they had his phone and bank records and Verizon's location data confirmed that Charles Ford had it gone driving around the roads near the BP station on the afternoon of August 31st. And his debit card statement listed an $11.21 purchase at a Burger King in Springboro, which is the, uh, the last place that Ford had said he had looked for Haas. So there was zero evidence that he'd driven seven miles south to Clarksville to dump a body. So they had this person of interest, but there's not really ev any evidence. But they're still trying to figure out how Gerald Haas actually died. And the Warren County Coroner's Office had been unable to establish a cause of death because of the soft tissue of the body and a lot of the natural elements and stuff like that. So on November 8th, Gerald Haas's skeleton is transported to the Human Identification Center at the University of Indianapolis, and a woman named Krista Latham, uh, she was a forensic anthropologist, and she runs the center. She cleaned the bones with like a combination of uh, water and some detergents, and she was able to identify a significant wound that appeared to have occurred around the time of Gerald Haas's death. And it is a fracture at the top of the left femur, right where the leg connects to the pelvis. The femur is the largest and the strongest bone in the body. And breaking it requires a lot of force. Something like getting hit by a car or falling from a really great height. So after they find out this information about the body, they hit a roadblock with Charles Ford. They have Etienne Fieri and Emmanuel Sylvia telling two different stories about each other and shit. They're like, 
Okay, I guess we're back at square one. Don't know exactly what to do at this point. So they send out a press release to the public to report anything suspicious in the area where Haas had disappeared. And a local TV station and the Dayton Daily News picked, uh, picked this up. And these tips start coming in, right? So some of the most credible potential witnesses were all residents of this cul-de-sac called Shepherd's Way. And it runs along the western boundary of where uh, Bill O'Brien's property was, where those three guys were hunting and tracking that deer. And this is about half a mile from where Haas's skeleton was found on the other side of uh, this soybean field. So one of the potential witnesses, uh, who was an elderly woman, who said that she'd been startled one mid-September morning to see a disheveled man in her wooded backyard. He was uh, peeking out from behind a tree, but that's all she saw. She's like, I, I saw him, and he was kind of peeking around this tree, and then he just kind of went back into the forest. And the thing about this forest is... You have to be a pretty good outdoorsman to be out there in that kind of element, which Gerald Haas was not. So another sighting comes from two guys, a man and his father-in-law, and uh, they said they had seen someone fitting Haas's description walking along the shoulder of State Route 22 in early September. And uh, they said that he might have had a bedroll slung beneath his backpack. They had thought it was odd that any would, anybody would be walking in uh, late summer heat because, you know, like uh, August around Ohio, Indiana area where I'm from, it's uh, early September. It's usually pretty warm still. It really is. So the father-in-law says that a friend of his who was a hunter had placed a deer feeder had placed a deer feeder in the area behind Shepherd's Way, that cul-de-sac, and he said he had been surprised when he found out that someone had been using the barrel-shaped feeder back there, and somebody had been using it as a crude stove. So, by November 21st, 2018, uh, the investigators, you know, they find out all this information from the Clarksville locals, the sheriff's office sends out a team of seven officers to comb the woods that are between the soybean field and Shepherd's Way. And this is where they make a very crucial discovery. And a clearing covered with, with leaves, uh, a thin tree along the clearing's edge had a cord running up high to its trunk to an anchor in the ground, and someone had draped a tarp over it you know, to form like a very basic shelter. And close by, they came across some burnt wood that was arranged in a crisscross pattern of a campfire. So they find this makeshift campsite, and they find it near a ravine with a small creek, you know, down at the bottom. This is right by a larger stream to the south called Todd Fork. So two detectives went down to this gorge, and they went through the water, the water was only a few inches deep, and this is where they come across a mound of leaves and broken branches, uh, and on top of it was a uh, zipped-up black backpack. And when they picked up the pack, they could see it was very, very soaked through, and it was covered with, like, leaves and, and mud and all this stuff. And uh, inside, they find probably some of the most random shit you've ever come across, okay? And they find his ruined computer hardware, as well as seven lighters, a canister of pepper spray, electrical tape, blue work gloves, a Nissan hood ornament, a copy of the New Testament, an ear of unshucked corn that uh, you could see it had char marks on it from roasting it, and they found three unwrapped Magnum condoms, which, you know what, man? Good for him. Good for him. So this is where they start coming up with the theory that Haas probably didn't die from foul play. And they start uh, formulating this theory that uh, Haas's mental health had just 
basically taken a downturn because he was putting so much of himself into Tesser. You know, this was like his, like I said, man, his hopes. It was his last shot. And they think that the closer he had gotten to success, he had grown more and more anxious. And the fact he was on those, uh, the tranquilizers that the side effect is anxiety that just kind of doubled it. And the fact that he was going to be basically stuck in this corporate world that he had rejected his entire life. You know, he had a long history of dealing with these problems and running off. And I mean, he had literally gone to Florida and became a vagrant after dropping out of college. You know, at one point he had ran off into the mountains for a long time after he realized he had wasted a bunch of his life on drugs. That's where came to the realization, you know, he's like, I got to do something with my life. So here's the cop's theory on what happened to Gerald Haas, okay? As he smoked outside the BP station on August 31st, it seems entirely in character that Haas might have made an abrupt decision to bail on the high-pressure life he'd built in Columbus. He was very overwhelmed and took that uh, that fantasy of simplicity and molded it into something far more frightening, and he chose to abandon all community and comfort to become a hermit. So he decided to basically say, fuck off, Tesser. I'm going to go live in the Ohio wilderness. So after walking or hitchhiking the seven miles between the BP station in Clinton County, right by uh, Bill O'Brien's estate, Haas probably survived in the Clarksville woods for weeks. And he was foraging food and camping supplies from the farms that are along that state route. And they say that he was losing weight because he wasn't eating meals. He was eating very small meals that he was cooking over open flames. He was not getting any kind of nutrition. So he started losing a bunch of weight, which is why he used that vine to hold his pants up because he had started losing weight. And it seems that he had never interacted with another soul while he was out there. He didn't want to. Their theory on the fractured femur, which can be a potentially fatal injury if it has a bunch of internal bleeding or even, or even bleeding of any kind for that matter. You know, if it's untreated, that could kill you. That could have occurred in a number of ways, they said. One detective theorized that Haas scaled a tree near the ravine to reach a deer stand, then accidentally fell out of it. My problem with that theory is if you're going to fall from that height and you're going to break a bone that strong and the, the biggest bone in your body, how are you not going to break anything else? Which I get it, the skeleton, uh, you know, his body was not complete, but at the in the same respect, there's no other visible signs of injury other than that. So... They say that might have happened, or he might have walked too close to the edge of the ravine and lost his footing. But in either scenario, Haas would have been separated from his backpack when he smashed into uh, the creek, which was covered with rocks. So if he would have been conscious after that fall, uh, he would have been badly injured, but... They say he might have pulled himself out of the ravine and crawled for nearly half a mile through the soybean plants before reaching that part of the forest. And then he flopped against, you know, the, the base of that honeysuckle tree and just closed his eyes to rest and never woke up. Still a mystery. It's up in the air. These are just theories because they can't prove any of this. The sad thing about it is... If Haas would have crawled towards Shepherd Way or Route 22, which were closer than where his body was found, he would have been able to flag someone down to take him to the hospital. Somebody would have seen him. So they're saying that he was so disoriented from physical trauma and malnutrition that he didn't know which way the shortest path to help was. But... They also think that he might have continued to just avoid human contact altogether because that's what he was doing. 
either way you look at it, when Gerald Haas died, he destroyed Tesser completely. Even if the hard drives in his backpack could have been salvaged, Haas was super paranoid. Like he had always described himself as a tinfoil hat guy. Even if they could have salvaged the hardware that Gerald Haas had, he was smart enough because he encrypted it so good and so strong that none of it would have been readable. Like the code he wrote for Tesser's blockchain was gone because he had never backed up anything. So Emmanuel Sylvia, you know, he kind of toyed with the idea of like, okay, like we're going to honor Gerald Haas. We're going to push the company forward. We're going to do it without him, but he just couldn't do it. He said he could not keep going like that. He had written to Gerald's mother in February and he had said, uh, Gerald was more of a friend than my partner, and with the code gone, I lost all motivation. As of now, Sylvia does say that he still plans to launch his educational blockchain, and that when he does, he will name it after Gerald Haas. Now, Haas's mother, obviously very grieving, she has become an amateur detective. She is in it to win it, and that is the coolest most respectable thing for a woman in her position to do i know a lot of people take grieving differently but she has taken it upon herself she has filled several notebooks with observations about tesser's investors and criminal records of clarksville residents and the alleged shortcomings of the warren county sheriff's office one thing about the uh the sheriff's office that pisses her off is that the detectives will not follow up on a clue that she got from uh, one of Gerald's Twitter accounts, which is at Composition4, F-O-R-E. She had kept very close tabs on the account throughout September 2018 when her son was missing, and she was hoping that she would see some activity that might indicate that her son was still alive. So as of September 22nd, the three most recent posts were all dated August 27th, which is four days before he disappeared. The first one was this just in. At one point in time, having things meant things. The second one, ran out of Fenibute, feel ambivalent about it. Number three, numerous time in my life, when I thought I was being the most selfless and considerate, in retrospect, I found I was egocentric, might have learnt a valuable lesson. And then the fourth one, which is the, definitely the weirdest, says, meanwhile, Antichrist. So, like I said, those three things were still on there on September 22nd. So... She goes back to check the account on September 25th, three days later, and those three posts had been deleted. And there was one post that was still left on there out of the four of them from August 27th, because there were four of them on August 27th. The other three had been deleted between September 22nd and September 25th. The fourth post that he had made was the only one that was still there. And it said, Meanwhile, Antichrist. And that's it. So his mom had repeatedly asked the Warren County Sheriff's Office to contact Twitter and obtain information about the IP address that was used to delete Gerald's tweets. And she's basically saying, I need this data to get a better sense of how long my son possibly survived in these woods and whether he used somebody else's Wi-Fi. And the investigator said that Twitter would need to perform extensive engineering efforts to recover information that is not necessary. And they declined to even give it a second thought. No follow-up whatsoever. And, you know, his mom has not given up on the notion that, that Gerald Haas might have been murdered. The fact that he had the New Testament in his backpack, she was thinking that he might have been engaging in a 30-day religious fast. 
you know, he might have had an accident in his weakened state, you know, from malnutrition, or the fact that he, you know, ran across somebody that could have done him harm while he was in that weak state. And she had gone on to say, his biggest flaw was that he had a loyalty for friends and a trusting nature. This trait caused him to be hurt and betrayed more than once. She also wants to recover all the items that were found in Gerald's backpack because it's basically all the possessions that her son left behind. But the Warren County Sheriff's Office has refused to release the property to her. And one of the deputies had written her and says, quote, I realize we have closed this investigation, but we feel obligated to maintain custody of the items we have to assist with further investigation should that become necessary in the future. And on top of that, Gerald Haas's mother has never been able to actually go to the wooded area where her son lived and died in because the guy who owns that property, Bill O'Brien, will not let her on the property. And this is according to law enforcement. Like I had mentioned previously, uh, Gerald Haas's legacy is pretty much on SoundCloud. He had uploaded dozens of original tracks as uh, both Tone Hog and Composition 4. Tone Hog is T-O-N-E-H-O-G, and Composition 4 is Composition F-O-R-E. You can kind of get uh, an idea of how Gerald Haas sees himself, you know, and how he changed through, through the years. You know, he did make some some beats that you can dance to that are rave beats. You know, one of them is called High Fidelity Hate. Another one is called Robotic Oompa Loompa March. Apparently not too many listeners actually like it, but um, that's pretty much what he left behind. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. It's It was a pretty complicated mess, and I apologize about the uh, length of time it took me to get this out, so I do apologize about that as well. And um, like I had mentioned at the top of the episode, I will not read reviews at the end. I will save those for next time, and I do have a lot of reviews to read. In September, we got Bruce Lee and Al Capone coming up, and like I had also mentioned, on September 1st, you have to unsubscribe, do a new search of the podcast, resubscribe. So unsubscribe, new search, resubscribe, especially on Spotify and Podcast Addict, uh, because the original feed will be dead. I mean, I'm still going to be doing shows. It's just a convoluted mess with the feed and all that bullshit. So, you know, if you don't see an episode up in the next, I don't know, 10 days, then that's probably why you need to uh, unsubscribe, do a new search for the podcast, and then resubscribe, and you'll see see the new stuff. So, all right. Hope you guys all enjoyed. See you on the flip side. at Kohl's. Take an extra 15% off on top of great sale prices. Kids tees are just $7.65 and under. Get 50% off Fila backpacks and get up to 60% off home must-haves like curtains, rugs, and throw pillows. Plus, get Kohl's cash. Plus, fast and free store pickup. Shop Kohl's and Kohl's.com. Select styles. Office valid through September 2nd. 15% off with promo code Let's Go. Some exclusions apply. See store or Kohl's.com for details. You can only rearrange your living room furniture so many times. It's your turn for a staycation in Indy. You've earned it. And if you want to, make it a night out in the city. Indiana residents can save up to 50% off hotel stays. The city of Indianapolis is excited to welcome you back safely. Check out visitindy.com to shop hotel rates and book your getaway. Your internet and wireless should always have you covered. And with Xfinity, you're covered far and wide. 
you'll get the best internet experience at home with Xfinity X5. And the best wireless coverage on the most reliable network with Xfinity Mobile. Plus, for a limited time, ask how to get $400 off an eligible Samsung 5G phone. To learn more, click or call today. Requires residential postpay Xfinity internet. Restrictions apply. Samsung offer ends 915. 5G only in parts of select cities. Help keep the devices in your home protected from Wi-Fi threats with Xfinity X5. If it's connected, it's protected. Because advanced security is free when you get Xfinity Internet and the XFi Gateway. And learn about upgrading your in-home Wi-Fi experience with XFi Complete. It includes unlimited internet data. And we'll help ensure you get the most Wi-Fi coverage throughout your home. Now that's simple, easy, awesome. Click or call today. Restrictions apply. XFi and XFi Complete available to Xfinity Internet customers with compatible XFi Gateway. 